Hello, thank you all for joining us. Super excited to be here with you. And I am absolutely thrilled to have Marshall and Matt with me today, uh, two time series experts that you have on the call with you. So go ahead and ask them your hardest time series question. I'm sure they would love to be able to answer it and dive deep. Matt Just ask Marshall. that to Matt, not to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Awesome. Uh, so let us know, where are you joining us from? I mean, I'm joining from sunny Boston. It is actually sunny out here. Uh, Matt Marshall, where are you dialing in from? That must be one of the four days a year that it's sunny in Boston. <laughs> Especially in March. I know. I'm a little excited, I have to say. <laughs> I, uh, I I was in Boston for a conference a few years ago um, in late April, maybe early May, um, and and went for a walk and, and came home with some sunburn, which was unexpected, but uh, very on brand for for maybe a time series geek. Um, I'm Matt. I uh, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. Nice. I see someone called in from uh, Trinidad and Tobago. That's really cool. Uh, I'm in Pittsburgh. Probably not quite as a uh, sunny as it is there. Uh, today is surprisingly not bad. We won like a uh, grayest, not greatest, but grayest city in America, I think last year. Um, you're actually seeing me in my my childhood bedroom. I'm here visiting my parents. Um, they want me to haul wood for them on a tree that they cut down. Awesome. It looks like we have a nice big global audience. So thank you all for joining us on this Friday. Uh, just wanted to kick off, let you all know what we're excited about to bring and chat about. And one of the big things that we're seeing, especially in this last year, is that models are continuing to break. So if you're a data scientist or an analyst and you're working on things, you know that a lot of the hard effort that you've put into helping your business succeed and being able to forecast or predict, a lot of the stuff that you're working on is no longer just let it ride. Like it's it's changing as the world is changing, and we're seeing a lot of uncertainty and unpredictable market uh, conditions happening. Um, hit us up if this is something that you're also seeing as well. I mean, how many models or forecasts or predictions that you all have built are actually relevant and working today? Or are you unsure if they're actually relevant or working today? It's a, it's a big thing to bring up, Lisa, because I... I as, as many of us know, with respect to COVID, you know, all of the models that people were building in 2019 and early 2020 just immediately went by the wayside, whether you were forecasting the, you know, the carbon footprint of people in a given location or trying to figure out, you know, how many people you were going to hire or, you know, what your protocols were going to be, or if you work in medicine, like so many things immediately went out the window. Um, and then now we're seeing, you know, people reemerge in different countries, different states are in various uh, levels of reemergence and and all of that, but one of the things that that people are grappling with now, and companies and organizations are grappling with, is um, how do you uh, how do you build models or forecasts in this new era of reemergence? Do you, for example, use the data that you've collected from 2020 and 2021? Um, do you get rid of that entirely and go back to pre-COVID and look at data from 2018 and 2019 to try and build forecasts in 2022. Um, all of these, I mean, we're we're in this time in which things need to, things are changing rapidly. And so we need to change ourselves rapidly to, to keep up with it. Absolutely. This is definitely something that we're seeing. What data do I use from what time frame? How often do I rebuild it? How often do I reforecast? Um, so that's some of the things that we're looking at helping to address in 8.0 and our new enhancements here. So a couple of new things that we are introducing is our AI catalog enhancements, direct connectivity to even more data sources, and being able to drive any of that scoring and predictive code right into your database so that you're not having to move your data. As Matt, you chatted about, you know, one of the things that we have to look at is what time frame of data do we need to use and from where? So could be introducing third party data into your models and building it to augment what you have. It could be looking at a certain time frame. Um, but just being able to have the flexibility that you need to be able to adjust is critical and what we're introducing in 8.0. Um, one of the other things that we're introducing in 8.0 is once you get a model in production, I mean, I would love to hear from the rest of you how well do you know it's performing once you get it out there? Do you even have time to take a look at it and make sure that you're rebuilding it as the world changes around you? Or are you just dealing with this onslaught of 
requests that you're getting from the business of like, I need this, I need that, I need this, and just kind of drinking out of a fire hose, you know? So one of the things that we are introducing is continuous AI and our automated retraining, which you're going to get to see with Marshall here in terms of being able to help. And finally, that wraps it up with time series. Time series is a huge, important, and new factor that a lot of organizations are taking on um, from a data science perspective. It's always been kind of the one that, I don't know, Matt, Marshall, do you think one of the harder data science problems to kind of get right? What do you think? Hardest. What's made it so hard? I honestly think like uh, you both have summarized some of it uh, already pretty well. Like times change and like you have to retrain very often. Um, and I think it requires more knowledge of like underlying factors going on in like a business or whatever you're forecasting for than any other machine learning problem that I know. Absolutely. Matt, what, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> time just affects every decision in the, in the model building process. So if you're building a data science model Let's, let's assume it's not a time series model. You have to engineer features or you generally engineer features. You have to identify sources of data. You have to identify, split your data up into training and validation and testing data. And, and all of those things still exist in uh, when you want to build a time series model, but there's this added dimension of complexity to it where time affects everything. Time does affect how you engineer new features in your model. Time does affect the types of models you can build. Time affects how you split data up into training and validation and testing sets. Time does affect the sources where you get your data. If you want to take two different data sets and combine them together, if you've got hourly data and then you've got daily data, how do you merge those two things together? Um, and it's possible to, to do, but there's all sorts of judgment calls that go into that. And so when it comes to time series, there's just so many decisions decisions that have to be made. And even for expert data science teams, I mean, I, I'm a data scientist with a, with a decade of experience. I'm a data scientist who, who went to, to graduate school for statistics. And so, you know, thinking about the things that we learned in grad school, it was so focused on these nice, neat, clean, ideal, theoretical worlds. And that's something that just, we, we, don't run into, you know, when we're actually trying to practice the, the, in the real world, that's not like the, the, the things that we're taught on paper don't align with the actual important things that we need to be able to do in the real world. And so, um, I'm being long winded here, but hopefully this helps to share just like how complex data science with time series is at every single stage of the process. And then as, the last thing I'll mention here is as Marshall said, when you want to retrain your data, when you want to try and, um, you know, build new models that the world is changing. And so with regular machine learning, it's often okay. If you gather way more data, if you gather data from more transactions or more observations or more people, that's okay. But in time series, there's uh, seriously diminishing returns to that, to where if you gather data over the last five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, at some point, your models can actually perform worse, the more data it has. So it's just really, really tough to get right. Absolutely. I know uh, Rosemary made a comment in there that she was agreeing all her models had to be rebuilt and looking at struggling with doing this um, and figuring out, figuring it out as well. Yeah. So, so one of the additions that we've also made with uh, 8.0, uh, not only have we always had time series at Data Robot in terms of automating it, but we're looking at one, taking this very complex topic and being able to put it directly into the hands of your business users with a no-code AI app builder so that you can help inform your business decision uh, makers exactly what they should be optimizing on, why they should be optimizing on, and getting a little bit more explanations. Because you know it's one thing to do the data science work, and then the next biggest challenge that all of you have in the data science world is how do you reframe that data science work in a way that business users can understand and deal with? I mean, what are your thoughts, Matt? Yeah, uh, there's a the question from Xerxes that I, I want to talk about. What about adding variable seasonality? And this is yet another area that complexity comes in where some variables may exhibit seasonality or these cyclical patterns. And those are things that in many cases have been disrupted. And so it's just, it's so complex to try and bring all of these things together. And then when integrating 
uh, one of the things that we've done with, with 8.0 is allow time series to be integrated with applications so that the users of these applications may not need to know about things like, like seasonality or stationarity or all of the complex things that go in on the front end of building the model, but are still able to use the model to make business decisions. Um, so I, I'm really, really excited about this. Um, Marshall, I imagine that you've got examples where uh, people can can use this and leverage this in a, in a very real business or organizational context. Yeah, I'm hoping you guys will get to get to see one today. <laughs> Well, speaking of seeing one today, do we want, let's jump into the demo because I know that we're gonna probably going to get a lot of questions around time series. So let's take, uh, Marshall's going to give us a nice tour on how we can look at time series uh, and automate some of this complexity that Matt was chatting about and some of these questions that you all are bringing up in the LinkedIn live chat as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, so first thing, let me just take a quick sip of water here and reintroduce myself. So hi again from uh, sunny Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm Marshall Krasenstein. I'm a customer facing data scientist, data robot. And today I'm going to walk you guys through this uh, side project I built that I think really shows some of the cool features we were just talking about for our platform. And so I have um, an older brother and he works for the uh, city government of uh, Detroit in the mayor's office. And he's worked for the city for a long time in a lot of different uh, sectors. And when I talk to him about uh, data robot and machine learning, trying to explain what I do and what our platform does, I asked him what kind of things would be nice if the city knew in advance and what kind of open data they had. And I love that comment, hi from Detroit, be kind to us. I, I actually love Detroit. Uh, I visit my brother uh, pretty often. He, he just bought uh, his first house down there. Um, well, what he told me was that Detroit actually has a great open data portal with a lot of detail about uh, crime reports and specifically calls to the Detroit Police Department. And so this thing I have up right now is uh, what that looks like. We can see City of Detroit open data portal up on the top left here. And so we can zoom in here. I'm not going to try and find where my brother lives. Doxing him probably wouldn't be the coolest thing in the world. But what I just want to show is if we zoom in far enough, we can see all these uh, blue dots come up here. And each one of these dots represents uh, a reported incident. So I could click here for a crime ID, and this will say, hey, on January 30th, we had this, this property damage over here. And over here, I could find, okay, larceny, theft of motor vehicle parts as well. Um, with a lot of granularity on like what happened, when it happened, down to like even the minute uh, it was reported. And so when I was looking at this, um, data over here and all this stuff across uh, the entire city, the first thing I thought was, um, geez, like, how how does a police department uh, deal, like, how do they plan for this stuff? Like, how do they know how much staffing they should have on a regular basis, a day out or a week out or something like that? And I realized that because this data reports the time of each crime, I could probably parse through this information and, and build a forecast myself. So I told my brother about that idea to forecast the number of 911 calls around the city. And he said that that was kind of stupid. Um, he told me that citywide crime isn't really important on its own. Uh, it turns out that um, Detroit is actually divided up into seven districts and 911 calls are usually divided into five different priority levels. So making a citywide forecast on its own would be cool, but it would only be useful if we were able to make a forecast for each district at each priority level, which effectively would be 35 different forecasts. That's seven districts times five call priorities per district. In other words, it had to be at the right grain of detail that it could actually be used. And so that's the use case I want to tackle. Uh, and before I get there, I, I can see this question, um, how do you tell which model is better for certain data? That's a really good question. I'm hoping I can talk to a little bit uh, with this thing called the no free lunch um, idea in data science, but we'll get there uh, when we get there. Um, so anyway, this is kind of the, the use case that I wanted to tackle, the idea of making future predictions across many groups. Uh, there's a couple ways you could call it. Um, here in Data Robot, uh, you could call this multi-series forecasting. And if you want to build a separate model for each of these, you could use segmented modeling. 
It's something that applies in every industry from predicting clothing sales in different stores across the country to account balances for different client types at banks to anticipating how much oil you might uh, get from like different drill types. And when you start to think about it, the use of forecasting and segmented modeling really shows up about everywhere. And I think it's something that data robots are very good at. Although we've got you know our time series expert on the call. Maybe there are certain areas where time series doesn't show. Like, what do you think, Matt? No, happy to jump in. I think that I think you're right. So the notion of segmented modeling is really important um, because historically, just because of computation ability or or whatever, um, you might be limited to building one model to rule them all. Maybe it's also about the granularity of data. Maybe in the past, to use the example that you've got on the screen here, there was only only data for Detroit as a whole, as opposed to looking at each of the individual districts or regions that you had mentioned um, for. Uh, for organizations in retail thinking about you know we now have data down to the SKU level that is recorded it's reliable we know it's accurate that we can you know build models all the way down to that SKU level whereas before because of computational limitations and data limitations we really did just need to say let's forecast for this entire department what we think sales are going to look like and so segmented modeling uh, segmented modeling excuse me allows us to say hey we do want to be able to understand things at the top level, but let's build a separate model. Like, and this is, um, you know, this kind of goes to Abdullah's question from a moment ago. How can we decide which model is better for certain data? Maybe an ARIMA model is best to predict one certain region in Detroit. Maybe an ETS model is best to best suited based on the data and everything we know to predict another region in Detroit. And with data robots segmented modeling capability, which you're about to show us, not to not to tip our hand too much, is we're basically going to be able to let data robot run a bunch of different models on each of the different regions and then tell us based on the data itself, which model does the best job at predicting for each of the different regions of Detroit. Um, so I'm really excited about this. And yes, it's in uh, there's applications in retail, in finance, in um, in civic government, in in basically every industry. So back over to you, Marshall. Yeah, no, fair. Um, so before uh, I show how like I address this problem in uh, Data Robot, I wanted to show what an end product might look like. So we talked about how you could build uh, these end applications in Data Robot, or how you could integrate the models into completely external things that you build yourself. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a developer by any means, but I do like uh, building a little like UI in front of my models from time to time. And that's, uh, that's what I did here. So this is an example of what an end product would look like. And this is actually powered by a data robot model where we're showing on in here every six hours, um, a, the number of police reports to a certain district across all priorities. Uh, and in this dotted blue line, uh, we see what we're forecasting out into the future. It doesn't have to be at this granularity. I'm making a forecast actually for every hour. So I could change this to be every three hours. If I want to bring in I think my brother somewhere in district three, I could bring in a second line and get a forecast for that too, to show these over here and build this kind of summary, uh, maybe take away the low priority stuff um, and, and plot again. Um, and this is just an example, something that you can build very easily if you have a reliable model prepared and um, good data made for it. So now what I want to do is show how we get to this, this end product right here. All right. So here I've pulled down data from the Detroit API, and I've pulled it into our data prep software so we can explore our data and make it model ready. And there's a ton of good information here. For example, I could see a description of what the call might be. And if I wanted, I could see, OK, we've got neighborhoods over here. And maybe within this, I'd like to see, I don't know, let's see bus boarding here, uh, investigate auto, um, larceny report. Maybe I'm curious what um, areas larceny is most prevalent in, and I could see that. And it might be interesting that a lot of times when a larceny report happens, there's no there's no neighborhood or address affiliated with it. But within data prep, you get a very fast way to kind of explore and, and get these insights really quick to get to know your data um, a little bit better. Um, but the other thing about this is I'm trying to predict um, on an hourly basis uh, the number of 911 calls by district and priority. And this this data is not at that granularity, right? All it is is just every single crime that 
uh, happens or every report that happens. Um, so we need to munch it a little bit and change it. And that's something that data prep's very good for. Because I I don't know about you, Matt, but I have never been given like a model ready data set in my life. Like when people say build me a forecast, they're like, okay, pull some data down. It's all in all these different places, make it forecast ready and then build a forecast. Yeah, da data is never, ever, ever ready. Uh, another one of the big lies that we were taught in grad school. <laughs> yeah, I never tell you until you get there. Um, but you can see, I go through this whole step here. This is entirely no code. Um, so if I wanted, I could even bring in my brother as kind of an expert on this data set um, to kind of help me figure out what stuff I'd want to maybe filter out here and how I could be generally reshaping uh, and computing new values. And I could document all these steps too, just to make sure he understands what I talk about. And just reshaping it in here, I can get for each district and each priority. So we make 35 different um, series here, the hourly reported calls um, going back for the last two months. And this is our final data set that we're going to build uh, forecasts on, okay? And so let's say we've kind of approved of this uh, model munging process um, and we're ready to actually build, build out that model. And um, so right here, I've loaded that ending data set. I can scroll down here and see the same thing that we were at the end of that step. Um, and I'm ready to build my forecast for 911 calls. And in order to kick off that modeling, I need to specify a couple of items. First, I want to forecast uh, 911 calls in my data set. That variable for the number of calls at a given hour is called incidents. And so that's what I, what I typed in here. And so I selected that as what I wanted to predict. And similarly, I have call hour in my data set to represent the time that a call occurred. So I put that in over here to get this series over time. And I've been a data scientist for a while now. Uh, and I can say, I mean, we've already said it, that time series can be uh, very complicated. And whether that's uh, traditional ARIMA models or like ETS or something like that, um, that you might learn in, in grad school or forecasting like in a business setting, uh, there's so much that you have to consider and each of these takes a lot of time. So here we can see how to kind of choose out how far we wanna forecast and derive features in a simple way. And if we want to look in more detail, we can see like what partitioning scheme we wanna make and specify a bunch of different time series features we might want in here. Um, one thing we talked about was segmented modeling, like building a separate type of model for every either district or priority or combination of the two. And that's something you can do in Data Robot just by clicking segmented modeling and then choosing that uh, over here. Um, and then finally, you know, uh, one thing that, and this takes a lot of, again, subject matter expertise, right? You have to know what factors might contribute to, let's say 911 calls in this case. And I think holidays might uh, be a consideration because I know yesterday was St. Patrick's Day and I don't know how it is in Detroit, but I know that people in Pittsburgh can get pretty rowdy around them. So one thing you can do is attach a calendar in here um, so that you can see the effect of holidays um, as you build your model and use those as contributing factors. Okay. Yeah. Marshall, that goes back to, I think, one of the questions that someone asked, how do I look at external variables and bring them into my existing data that I have when I am modeling stuff out? Yeah, um, no, that that is an incredibly good question. And that's something that, for me, before I even came to Data Robot, I found very challenging. I figured you want to build a time series, you get you get a date, and you get like the thing that you're trying to forecast, and you forecast that out with something like a, an ARIMA model. Um, but the truth is that a lot of other external variables, as you probably realize, um, can contribute to your model. And so in that process, um, where you transform your data, you do things like differencing to engineer uh, new types of features. And it becomes a multivariate data set anyway. And what it ends up being is that these external features, you can do the same thing to, to help you like uh, forecast. I hope that makes sense. I, I don't wanna butcher like the description of doing it. Yeah, if, if I can jump in, this is one of the things that I love most about Data Robot and, and in a very related way, one of the things that I found most challenging about trying to forecast outside of Data Robot, you know, like, Think about, you know, you, you were talking about differencing or lagging your features. Um, that's something that you generally need to do manually. 
Um, one of the things that you see on your screen there is features known in advance. So the features that, you know, the, the way that we treat features that we would know ahead of time, for example, you know how many stoplights are going to be in a certain region in advance because that's just something that you know. You don't have to lag that variable because you know it in advance. Um, if you wanted to use temperature or precipitation though, you wouldn't necessarily know that ahead of time. You wouldn't know that value until the time that it actually occurs. And so those two types of variables, variables we know ahead of time and that we don't, have to be treated very, very differently in time series. And one of the big problems is that if you're coding in R or in Python or doing this in Excel or whatever, you're never going to know, you know, that that's not something that you're just going to automatically know in advance. Hey, this is, you know, this like, uh, or rather, let me rephrase that in R or Python or whatever. It's not going to tell it you that there's an issue. Python's not going to yell at you and say that there's an error in your data because that's not something Python is set up to necessarily detect, but that's something that you have to do. So this and the calendar features and all of that that are going to engineer variables to detect how long until the next holiday or something like that, these are things that take really, really manual processes and really complex processes and make it easier. And I think that there's another term for processes that are manual and complex. That's error prone. So really what we're doing here is taking this process that's definitely error prone because it's highly manual, it's highly complex, so that even for advanced data science teams, we just make it easier. We take that error prone nature away from this, allow people to focus on the problem that they're trying to focus on, and then not need to worry about, did I difference this variable or lag this variable or calculate the summary statistic in the right way without leaking information to my test set? Um, so, so yeah, just one of the many things here that allow us to focus on forecasting for the real world, not the ideal world. Yeah. Or you could, you know, keep doing it the other way. And, uh, you mess up, you might wonder why your model is not making good predictions, but you know, a lot of models fail. So I, hopefully it'll be okay. Um, oh, but when I, it comes I, to the I, forecasting ones though, I'd have to say it's, uh, a little more impactful to your bottom line if you get these ones wrong, because typically they're supporting your operations team. So I don't know if I'd take Marshall's advice to heart on that one. Don't, don't take my <laughs> advice. That was, that was bad and cruel and unusual advice. But anyway, I, I, I want to keep going on this thing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click the start button here uh, and we can watch Data Robot in action. And what's happening behind the scenes is that Data Robot's taking this data set, splitting it up, and engineering features based on the data that I uploaded. And then it's going to look at correlations between uh, these features and our target so that it can start building models. And it's going to build all kinds of different models and score them against each other and make a model leaderboard that will help us pick the best model to address this problem. So this is where I kind of go into that no free lunch thing, like where we're saying, OK, Arima or ETS or neural network or something else like the answer is you don't you don't get to just pick one that just works all the time. Like I've definitely seen memes where people say like go XGBoost. And XGBoost is a great algorithm, for example, but it's not it's not always the one uh that, that's best for a given problem. As as you can imagine, sometimes a, a linear model is much better, or a neural network might be much better. Um and data robots going to try all these modeling types and find the best one to the given uh problem, which in this case is this Detroit data. Now, uh, Data Robot runs pretty quickly for training all these, but this project will take maybe maybe an hour or so to finish up. So I'm going to go ahead and pretend that I'm on a baking show as it derives these time series features over here um, and go to a completed project. So all right, same data set, but we can see that we've finished this uh, feature generation and model building process. And if I look over here, I've created 336 new features out of my original five features. And um, some of these are, they're simple. Like here's a 257 hour rolling mean, 168 hour median, but sometimes um, they can get a little bit more uh, complex too, and yet still have some importance in determining our outcome, All right? And you know, Matt, you, you harped on this and it's, it's such a relevant point that engineering these features, yes, like, it does take time to build these, but the really critical thing about it, especially if you know some things in advance in your model, is that it's error prone. If you do it wrong, then you're going to end up with a model that at 
best performs poorly, but at worst looks like it performs well until you get to prediction time and realize, oh shit, like I I made these features that I can't even actually use. And that sucks to have to go back and uh, do that again. That's right. Like exactly you build a model that looks like you're getting you know 95 98 99 99.99 percent .99 accuracy or whatever the metric you care about is and then you know and then you deploy that model and it's not working well and it takes hours days weeks to investigate and identify the source of that and it's something that was just a, a mistake and that's not i don't want to say that that's anybody's fault it's just again this is a complex and time-consuming process um, so one of the things that I'm curious, Marshall is, and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but, um, so as a, again, we're data scientists as, as a data scientist, when I hear engineering, all of these features, my mind immediately goes to overfitting my, my model is going to suffer from high error due to variance. We're overfitting our model to the data because naturally, you know, taking five and engineering 300, some features out of it, there's going to be issues with that. So can you share with us? why that's not actually the concern or a concern that we should be having in this case. Yeah, that's a good. So it, it, there's actually ends up being quite a few answers to this because data robots going to take a couple of steps, but I think the fastest answer is to say data robot will engineer these features and it also executes uh what you could call a supervised feature reduction process. So you can see we actually derived more than uh the 300 we derived more than 400 features uh, on this project. But we looked for correlations between these and our target and managed to reduce kind of like redundant or unnecessary features by um, 92 over here. And in the model fitting process, we'll see certain times when Data Robot will actually make a, a smaller list of features um, that it detects might be even better and more parsimonious for our model. So th there's multiple layers for reasons why it's OK that we build all these uh, within Data Robot or having bigger data sets. But it's, it's an important point because time series is one of those unique cases where too much data to your earlier point can actually be a little bit of a bad thing. All right, so let's go ahead and go to our model leaderboard here. So I said we, we engineered all these features and we also built models. And so if we look at the top, we see 21 uh, different models have been built and evaluated against each other. And there are a range of different things. Like here I'm showing uh, an XGBoost model like I brought up earlier. There's a neural network in here, blenders of models, um, elastic nets in here, Eureka models, which would be a whole different like live stream on its own are also in here as well, uh, and a few others. Um, but I wanna go in and look at this uh, XGBoost model for a second in here. So for interpretability, you can use this blueprint to see exactly what happens that's from your raw data to every transformation that goes on here to your final model to the predictions that get outputted in a direct sorry directed acyclic graph uh, we generate these for every model um, that's created within data robot so you always understand what it's actually doing behind the scenes because some of it is you know it's more than a modeling step um, in addition, there's multiple views for evaluating the quality of your model. So here's one where we can plot the, the accuracy over time on our forecast, where the blue represents the predicted values and the orange represents the, the actuals in this case. For um, understanding, we can also see uh, the impact of some of our features. So these are what we uploaded and we can see what's most important um, on an aggregate level and even see that for all the features that we derived over here, but on a prediction by prediction level, and this is not just for time series, this is for any given model, you can see the main factors that drive a prediction for every single record you generate predictions on within Data Robot. Um, and that even includes things that you might not build within Data Robot. You can actually persist your own models and, and upload them into here and get prediction explanations uh, that way. But that's that's outside what I'm showing for uh, for this one right here. All right. So I've studied this model um, and I actually think it's pretty good. Um, so maybe you guys are saying like, okay, way to go, Marshall, tip of the hat to you, you, you build a model. Um, but really like that's not, that's not the ending stage here. Uh, just building a model uh, is actually not very useful if it lives on your computer because nobody can really benefit from the predictions uh, it generates and there's no 
trust in the model accuracy down the road because you haven't continually tracked it um, once you've actually um, deployed it. Uh, and so taking a model, operationalizing it so that it can be used in any downstream process is what um, MLOps or machine learning operations is for. And that's one of Data Robot's kind of core pillars. So right from here, I could go you know, quick predict, deploy, um, and set up a new deployment um, in a matter of a few minutes, just filling out uh, a small almost form. And it will attach a REST API to it so that it could be used um, in any downstream uh, process. Uh, and outside of Data Robot, at least at some of my old companies, that process of going from like model on data scientist laptop to potentially a different language for IT can take months, actual months. Uh, here, it's it's only a few minutes. It's a productionized process. Um, but you can actually get a little bit more than a model that you can use um, anywhere. Uh, oh, I see a question over here. You have missing causals in that model you just showed. What do you think the missing causals are? Oh, God, there could be many causal factors uh, in a model. And and you'll have to forgive me on some of these. Like, there's there's always additional data you could pull in to include more, like, uh, causal factors and stuff. Um, but for, oh, really sorry, quickly, Matt. Marshall, one of the things that I did want to bring up with respect to deploying is um, think about how how we're trained. So for those of you on, on the call who are data scientists or are Broadly, I'll wave my hands and say data professionals. Um, people often gravitate toward data science side, like the model building side and the analysis side, or toward like the data engineering side and the software development side. And it's it often takes years for people to develop both sets of those skills. And so here within Data Robot, you know, if, if I think about my personal trajectory as a data scientist, I focus coming way more from like the statsy model building side of things. You know, what we're looking at now is, you know, what I would need to do in this case is I would need to learn what is our deployment environment, how to do that. And then I would have to smack my head against the keyboard over and over and over and over and over again until I figure out what's the right way to get my model, export it in the right form, get it deployed to a certain location, and then monitor that. And so that's really, really, you know, that that takes so much time and energy for data scientists with even moderate experience. And so, you know, on the flip side, people who come from that data engineering software development side, you're going to see something similar for those people as well. They might be able to really quickly deploy, but it will take a lot longer for them to grok the machine learning and the model building and the analysis side on it. So it's important to be able to, you know, to bring all of these pieces together so that individuals are able to go fully end to end with this. And then also, as Lisa mentioned earlier, integrate it with, you know, not only monitoring, but also continuous AI and being able to retrain, um, retrain that model. So, yeah. so uh, Marshall, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I know we're getting a little bit pinchy, but we've got such great uh, questions and comments coming up. Yeah, I'm sorry I keep rambling on here. Uh, no one worries. thing I'll say uh, for Bill, I see you're asking these questions. Please like reach out to me uh, individually. I, I want to make this thing like very good. And to your point, like experimental flexibility on this is great. And it's not always more data. And sometimes additional things that you might think could help can be helpful. But like, I would love to talk to you offline about uh, some of the stuff for, for this model, at least. Yeah. Um, so why don't you quickly hit on our, uh, once we get these models into production and monitoring in the continuous AI that Matt was also chatting about, and then I'd love to wrap us up with maybe some of the things we didn't see and ask you all, what are you forecasting? What projects you're working on? Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, so within um, our platform, Fortunately, you get a little bit more than just uh, like an API attached to a model because that's good for being able to build it downstream and integrate it into uh, new processes. But even if you integrate it, that can actually be damaging if your model, you know, at one time was good and then turns out to decay a little bit in the future. And we've seen this happen before with uh, models um, that happened when when COVID happened. They were good for a time and then the background information fundamentally changed and it destroyed them. Um, so with every model you deploy in DataRobot, you also are able to monitor it for certain attributes.
for example, service health. This is to say, hey, when you request predictions from a model, I don't know if anyone on this call has ever run into this, but how many times does an error come out as a result? Uh, if you're not able to generate predictions from a model, your model's not doing much for the business. And luckily for this one, it's performing well. Every single time I deploy a model, I'm running into errors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in terms of uh, accuracy, I, I feel like this is an intuitive one to want to track. But for time series, tracking accuracy is super easy because every day as you collect data, you're you're learning what actually happened relative to your forecast. And so you can set data robot to store those actuals, compare it to your forecast, and make sure that your accuracy is not deteriorating over time when something like, I don't know, COVID happens or a war in Ukraine happens for something relevant to that. Um, and okay, we're doing good with that. But finally, we've got a little bit of a warning for drift. And what drift means is that the data that you are scoring on, the attributes about it, um, have fundamentally changed from uh, what your training data uh, was. So even if accuracy is pretty good, we have this drift warning. So Matt, why do you think having like high drift might be like a, a warning sign for a model? So, I mean, when it comes to drift, think about the change in your input. So Bill was asking earlier about what are some of the causal factors, you know, that, that are missing that we might not have in this data. Uh, for example, with crime data, um, often it's about, you know, it's the way that that data is gathered might be based on enforcement. So maybe there's external data about, about, you know, where police are deployed or other individuals are deployed. And so with that being said, you know, thinking about, you know, how those numbers change, those inputs might change and influence our model. It's really important. It's not just about knowing is our model performing at 90% or 95% accuracy, but it's also are the underlying conditions changing in a way and that's almost like an early warning indicator that may let us know that accuracy is about to dip because our inputs are changing. So we're just, you know, we want to be able to make sure to understand what are the conditions in the world, what's changing, and are we staying ahead of it? So it's, I think, one more way for us to just proactively identify, hey, there might be this concern, be aware of it and be cognizant of it and recognize you may need to start retraining your model sooner than you expect. Yeah. Um, I, I see another question. You guys are asking really good questions here. Um, yes, Data Robot uh, does generate um, prediction intervals, even for um, non-linear models, uh, using uh, this thing you can do called conformal inference. So you can actually get this for this model too. I didn't put in the app I built because, like, I've got multiple series, and I was worried that having a prediction interval would just look really weird in the <laughs> UI sense. Um, but they're important things to have, and you can you can generate those. Um, okay, so. We're checking this model and we've got this drift warning. And so and now what? Like, let's say this is a trigger that we want to retrain the model. And that process of having to retrain the model can be very painful for companies, especially after they dumped all these resources into actually deploying the model. Now you're saying you have to take it down from production, like retrain it and put it back up. That can be really hard. Um, but with Data Robot, you can do it, first of all, with the click of a button, but second of all, even less because you can set up uh, triggers to automatically retrain and sometimes replace your model. So that trigger could be maybe a schedule once a week, retrain it, pick the best thing from our leaderboard that we just saw and put that up. Or um, it could be, hey, if data drift you know, goes from you know, this warning sign to a red exclamation point, like uh, then at that point, let's retrain the model and find something new with uh, that would have lower drift on this. And then finally, you can set up um, other models to actually track um, what your model is predicting. Like, so you have a champion model that you deployed, but you could send those same prediction requests to other models and get uh, the predictions that they're generating too. And if it turns out their accuracy is a little bit better than um, the model that you have, you can hot swap them on the fly uh, so that you have a different type of model that might handle a new type of problem a little bit uh, better. Right. Amazing. Thank you, Marshall. We have, uh, we're at 145. I know we've been really, wow. really going here. Um, would love for all of you to have an in-depth demo. If that's something that's of interest of you with time series in particular, uh, please reach out to us, sign up for us, go ahead and contact us on our contact us page. Uh, just a quick highlight of what you didn't get to see in our time series. Um, just so you know, is anomaly detection is something that we can do. Cold start and partial history is a great thing that we do. We have automated clustering of time series. 
as well as now casting and a ton of other deep features. So highly uh, recommend that you come to the Data Robot website, check out the Time Series product. Definitely engage with us. Time Series is something that we do extremely well and are very unique at, at Data Robot. We have all kinds of automated guardrails for you to make this easy for you. And it's so important and relevant uh, today. I mean, all of you are having to look at how do you drive and streamline and foresee and adapt to the shocks and the changes that are happening in your day-to-day -day work that impact your business. So uh, with that, I wanna say thank you to Matt and Marshall for joining us. Thank all of you for joining us and loved the engagement. It was amazing. I loved all those questions. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again on another LinkedIn Live soon. And thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, guys.